conjunction uh, preferred departure routes as we call it yeah. between the uh, approach control and the or departure control rather and the center mm -hmm. from there he calls ground control who uh, handles all aircraft moving on the taxi areas out to the runway and that gets kind of busy sometimes it does especially at intercontinental yeah it seems like southwest freeway at five o'clock occasionally at intercontinental and at hobby with all the traffic that's on the ground just trying to get up in the air so y'all keep that all sorted out that's correct uh, from there, the ground controller takes him out to the runway and uh, switches him over to the tower, or what we call the local controller. Uh -huh. Local controller clears him for takeoff and the, gives him a heading based on a 360-degree uh, radius mm -hmm. and uh, gets him going in the direction that he is filed for and the direction he wants to go. Mm -hmm. From there, uh, once he's airborne, and he's turned over to departure control. Departure control therefore works him out uh, in his route of flight along his prefer preferred departure route mm -hmm. until he reaches specified altitudes, hands him off to Houston Center, and then Max's boys take over mm -hmm. from there. Now, Max, what do you do with them? Okay. Uh, uh, do these guys, these guys are always in communication with you, though, aren't they, Max, with the Houston Center, so that you, no surprises come your way. Oh, that's correct. All Ideally. Of this, yeah, all of this yeah. has been coordinated. The, uh, the terminal facility, the approach control has a computer and we have computers and the computers communicate with one another so we all are aware of the flight plan we're also aware of the requested altitude or flight levels that the aircraft mm -hmm. so once the aircraft comes over from departure control he contacts one of our sectors and i think it's uh, maybe it would help to note here the the center is quite a large uh, covers quite a large airspace in fact the houston center is the biggest in the country isn't it or one of the biggest it's one of the large ones i'm not sure that we're the largest in square miles mm -hmm. but uh, we run almost to el paso over to uh, mobile alabama and so mobile alabama to the east el paso to the west how far up north i know dallas has its own center uh, we run up just to about uh, waco we have okay. include austin san antonio waco and uh, on a line east. Uh -huh. uh, anyway, the center is subdivided into 36 smaller units. We call them sectors. Mm -hmm. So the aircraft that uh, Ron's talking about, he is handed off to one of our low altitude sectors who talks to him until he's out of about 23,000, then if it's a jet, going to high altitude structure. And then the aircraft is switched over to the high altitude se sector and he continues his climb on, say, uh, if you're, in the case you're talking about Miami, he's climbing out to 33,000 or 37,000. And then he just progressively goes through these sectors until he reaches over to, uh, he, we would hand him off to Jacksonville or Miami Center, mm -hmm. depending on his route of flight. Mm -hmm. And all of this uh, flight data on the aircraft is uh, transmitted via the computers. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking to two different fellows here. One is up in the tower and handles all the traffic that's right around the terminal areas we're referring to it, or the city, or the airport. Okay. And, uh, and Max is out there, he's talking to... Now what I want to get to in a few minutes, and y'all get your ammunition all cooked up, it seems to me that Max has a pretty soft, cushy job of it sitting out there, and the guy in the tower is really working it. And uh, we'll get an explanation of that and be right back. You've been cheated, swindled, flim flammed ripped off, ignored, tricked, put on hold, fleece, rejected and neglected. Who cares? Gail Anderson. She's the On Your Side reporter for Channel 2 News, and she fights for your consumer rights. Gail knows that most of the people you do business with are honest and hardworking, but she also knows that there are always a few rotten apples who can make whole industries look bad. So she takes on that negligent landlord, the dishonest salesman, the cheat, the fraud, the ripoff artist, and she gets results. Watch Channel 2 News and you'll see Gail confront those businessmen, bureaucrats, and bunglers who seem to think that they can get away with murder because no one's watching. From simple misunderstandings to outright criminal activity, Gail Anderson watches out for you, the consumer. Once she's on a story, she digs in and uncovers all the facts and then brings you the results only on Channel 2 News. Gail Anderson and Channel 2 News, on your side. The Greater Houston Area Red Cross is sponsoring a citywide Learn to Swim program through August the 15th. For information or registration and pool locations, call 526-8300, 526-8300. We're talking about the traffic in the air, and it sometimes gets just about as rough as it does on the freeways in the city of Houston. Of course, there's a bit more space up there to deal with it, but there are an awful lot of airplanes that come into and go out of the Houston area. 
We're talking today, and primarily we have this going because uh, this coming July 6th, the 50th anniversary of air traffic control. Is that just for Houston or for the whole country? It must be just the... for, the, for the whole country. Okay, for the whole country, 50th anniversary. And uh, we're talking with uh, Ron Dickey, air traffic controller and publicity coordinator, and with Max Tyndall. Now, uh, now, Ron was just a little bit late because of the traffic on the freeways, and now he's worrying about how he's going to get up to Intercontinental Airport because he goes to work this evening. And this is pretty amazing that these people who deal with all this traffic in the air can't get around very easily on the ground. Now, if we just had a plane waiting for you out here, Ron, you could get on up there with no problem at all. Is it true that uh, Max has the easy job here? I mean, he, he doesn't sound... When I talk to Center when I'm flying, it's, they're so relaxed, and they, you know, there's not that much air traffic. In fact, sometimes when the weather's really bad and it's nighttime, I, I just pray for them to hurry up and say something to know that the radios are still working. Whereas you guys in the tower, when you get that close to the city, it's just going all the time. And I'm having to listen for my call sign, and I'm having to try to understand what you're saying when you're saying it so quickly. It's, it's a pretty tough job you've got in the run. Well, it's hard to say uh, which one is really the tougher one. I've never worked oh, especially in Especially with Max sitting here right next well, to you. Well, that's true, yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> I've never worked in the center, and the only thing that I know about it is just when I've gone over there to uh, to visit and to observe. Yeah. So yeah. to give a real op opinion of which one works the hardest, I really couldn't okay, say. Okay, now you don't worry. Is, is center reserved for the the real old timers, the old guys with all the wisdom and the no. and get, no, okay, and just uh, not that not that you look any older than <laughs> than Ron does, Max, but uh, but even here now, I can, just looking at the two of you, Max is all laid back in the chair and relaxed, and and you're ready to get up to Intercontinental Airport and get to work, aren't you? Huh? <laughs> okay, we're going to take some calls about air traffic in the Houston area or the air traffic controllers uh, specifically. Seven seven one four three two one is our telephone number. If you call long distance from a pay booth or from a mobile telephone. 7714716. And if you have one of those contraptions up in the cockpit of an airplane and you're listening to us right now, and by the way, we do get up on the automatic direction finders, uh, the ADF as we call it, we can listen to AM radio stations. So there may be some pilots who would like to call in and find out just what in the world is going on and why they can't get to the airport. Hi, Carl, you're on KPRC Radio. Thank you, Doug. I've got a couple of questions, if I could. Yes, sir. Uh, number one, uh, how does Intercontinental rank among major uh, gateway airports. Uh, you mean insofar as the amount of traffic? Right. It uh -huh. seems like uh, Intercontinental is about as busy as some say, like, well, of course, like O'Hare is a monster, but uh, LAX and yeah. Kennedy and some of the others. Yeah. How about that, Ron? Uh, Houston is ranked sixth in the nation in total instrument operations, 685,000 operations per year. Okay, what does that come down to on a, say, an hourly basis, an average hour? Uh, that I don't know. Okay. That, uh, I didn't realize it was that busy. Is that, is that uh, uh, IAH or... Uh, That's Houston Airplane. Approach Control. Oh, I see. Uh, airplanes coming into, going to any airport within the city, but principally... Within a 45 mile radius of okay. uh, downtown. Okay. I see. And in the, uh, with the controllers, do you rotate among say approach control and departure and up in the tower cab and do you or, or do you have a specific job that you go to and, and that's where you stay at intercontinental and houston approach it's all the same uh, controllers we have specified tower days where we go to the tower and work the other days uh, we work in the approach and uh, departure it's all one facility it's just two different positions and we rotate through the positions i see and is there a minimum age for uh, i understand there looking to hire some more uh to get that information Houston, but the, the system itself to get that information as far as minimum age i don't know if there is a minimum age uh you might call the office of personnel management in the federal building downtown they can probably give you that information a lot better than i can I see. thank you very much thank you for calling carl are you thinking about going into the business by the way well i don't know uh but i do know that you were behind me when it comes to being a fan. I, I just love anything that has to do with anything that gets off the ground. Good for you, Carl. Thanks. And I hope you get in there, too, because you, I, can, I easily understand your speech. You talk very clearly, and some of them may not sometimes. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, I tried to listen to some controllers sometime on the radio, and I, I think it must take a real special breed of person to communicate. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, I think they have a hard... It's busy. Uh, it's... I, I, of course, I'm not a pilot. I, I'm not used to it. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, 
it takes a real special breed of person to, uh, to learn to communicate in, in that environment. I think a lot of us pilots complain about not being able to understand the controller sometimes, but I believe they have a r much rougher time understanding us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carl, and good luck. Hi, Rod, you're on KPRC Radio. How are you today? I'm just fine, Judge. I have a question. I have this fascination with hot air balloons and living in northwest Houston on my way to work. In the mornings, I see these balloons floating over 290 and going about on their own way, wherever the wind will take them. Uh -huh. And I realize that these are licensed by the FAA, and I was wanting to ask your fellows there if they have any direction over the hot air balloons and where they, I realize they're at the mercy of the winds, but as to where they can travel and if they have to file a flight plan as such. That is a very good question, Rob. Uh, they do not have to file a flight plan, and they are not required to be in direct contact with the tower, as far as I know, unless they are within a uh, specified area within an airport. What if they get within that area, though? What if the wind just carries them over there? What's going to happen? One thing, we're going to miss them. <laughs> <laughs> as far as the other things, uh, I guess it all depends on the uh, circumstances and... Uh, uh, the flight standards would probably talk to the pilot of the balloon, uh, yeah. per se. And I love the way you there. say that, just talk to them. Yeah. I imagine it would be a good <laughs> chewing out, wouldn't it? Well, it all depends. There's a lot of mitigating circumstances yeah. and everything. Like nature. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> real hard to deal with nature. You know, Rod, it's interesting you should bring that up because I hadn't really thought about that potential problem before. I'm sure hot air ballooners have. But, uh, boy, if one of those things started drifting right over here to come in, you'd have to shut it down for a while, wouldn't you? Uh, if you could find a place to put it. Yeah. That's the whole problem. Yeah. Well, it, thanks. It'd be my luck. I'd have to put it down right on the tarmac. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rod. Thank you. <laughs> We're talking about controlling the air around the city of Houston. We'll be right back. Good day. Still trying to make up your mind where to go if you're overseas vacation? Down under. That's the go. Real change for the better. To convince you, here's a smooth talking bloke with some summer 86 package deals to care for Australia. Where you go, mate. Right, Paul. Aussie holidays are closer than ever, thanks to Continental Airlines, the only airline that flies you direct from Houston to the Wonder Down Under twice every day. Now Continental wants to give you Australia on sale with six days and five nights at the five-star region hotels in Sydney or Melbourne, round-trip airfare and all transfers for only $1,209. That's just $3 more than regular round-trip airfare. What a deal. Five nights for three bucks. Call Continental at 1-800-525-2560. That's 1-800-525-2560. Then come and say good day. Nice job, son. Spoken like a professional. See you in Australia. Come and say good day. See you tomorrow. Make it eggs. Make it eggs. Out to eat, have a treat, ask for eggs. Frittatas, quiche, crepe, and flay. Omelets in your favorite cafe. Make it eggs. Make it eggs. When you're out, there's no doubt. Order eggs. A brunch with friends at eggs to your day. Eggs at restaurants, a delicious entree. Make it light, make it right, make it eggs. The Incredible. Sponsored egg. by the American Egg Board. Hi, it's Phil for Purex. I'm here at Mount Rushmore next to the ear of George Washington to point out how small Purex may look next to the big guys. But we've got something they don't. See, Purex makes quality cleaning products like they do, but we sell ours for less. That's why we can say, <coughs> Purex is America's first choice in value, clear across the USA. So be a smart shopper and clean up the Purex way. Thanks for listening, George. Purex, America's first choice in value. We're talking to two fellows this afternoon who have the unenviable job, uh, at least in some ways, the tough job of handling the air traffic around this busy city. Uh, one is Max Tindall. Max is uh, dealing with Houston Center, which is more or less the traffic outside the, what we call the terminal area, outside the airport area of the city of Houston. And the other is Ron Dickey, who is the uh, air traffic controller in the tower out of Intercontinental Airport and is also the publicity coordinator for the 50th anniversary of air traffic control that will be celebrated this July 6th. Hi, Arthur. You're on KPRC Radio. Thank you, Doug. What I want to call in, uh, this was recently uh, the FFA had turned loose a report regarding the Delta crash uh, a year ago, uh, last year in Dallas. Yes. They made a comment up there as some of the air traffic controllers were 
making a comment that their responsibility was for air separation of planes and not for weather uh, notification, especially for the pilots. And I'd like for your guests to comment on that particular point that they, uh, they made reference to that report up there. Very good. Which one of you would like to take that, Max? Uh, yeah. Respond to that to the, to the extent that I can. Uh, we do have a responsibility for notifying the uh, pilot of aircraft of uh, any weather that he may be encountering. And also, uh, we collect uh, what we call PIREPS, pilot reports, uh, from other aircraft that have been through particular areas. And uh, we do disseminate that information, and we have an obligation to to disseminate that information to aircraft uh, on, the, uh, on the frequency. There are other provisions, though, uh, when pilots uh, file their flight plans for the flight service stations, they receive weather briefings uh, from those folks. Uh, however, the, uh, the primary concern of the controller is to uh, provide separation to traffic, but we will uh, notify them of known weather phenomena that, uh, that is in the area that would affect his flight path. Now, that is not uh, a legal requirement, though, of your responsibility. I have, when I'm flying, I always, um, uh, if there's a major thunderstorm within an airport area or something, I've always been notified. Now, to the magnitude of it uh, and all the rest of it, what I'm going to encounter in there, that's something that very often a meteorologist could not do because these things erupt suddenly. Uh, sometimes the most unassuming cells can be extremely dangerous. But that is not really a part of your legal responsibility, is it, to, uh, to transmit this to the pilot? Is that correct? I believe that's correct uh, in the way you stated that. Uh, however, we will provide the information that we have. Uh, we cannot provide information uh, on weather phenomena yeah. that we don't know that about. We don't know about or don't understand. Yeah. Arthur, does that answer that question? Uh, one, one other quick point. Yes, sir. I, uh, are the frequencies that the pilots are assigned to as you communicate back and forth to them, to their altitudes and so forth, pilots are in the uh, flight uh, pattern that are, uh, uh, let's say, ahead of the landing of these people. Are they allowed to tune in, let's say a comment is made by a pilot, you know, say, hey, that, that thunderstorm had a lot of bumping or whatever. Are they listening in to that kind of information as they're approaching? Uh, yes, the, uh, the aircraft that are on the common frequency, that, and now, uh, for example, in the center, uh, if we're talking about a high altitude sector, there may be 15 or 20 aircraft on that same frequency, and as, an, as a pilot reports that over the radio to the controller, uh, that he's encountered some turbulence or something of that nature, the other aircraft are going to be hearing that, and then in turn, the, uh, the controller will normally uh, retransmit that information that another uh, aircraft had reported that. Very good. Appreciate it. Thank you, Thank Arthur, you for calling. Thank you. Uh, and speaking of traffic, oh, this time it's on the ground. We're going to check with uh, Michael Shiloh and see what the situation is out in Houston right now on the ground. The biggest problem right now seems to be the outbound southwest freeway at Bissonette. There's a jackknifed 18 wheeler and some fuel spilled out there too as a result of the accident. At present, the freeway outbound is closed off. Traffic is being diverted to the feeder and it's backing up to Fondren on the outbound southwest freeway. Once again, that jackknifed 18 wheeler is at Bissonette. Inbound at Chimney Rock, an accident has been cleared, but still slow traffic starting at Bel Air. And on the north freeway, inbound over the loop. Once again, because of construction work, only the left and right lanes are getting through. This is KPRC traffic. Now you can save one-third off the price of an outstanding radial tire made by Michelin and backed by Sears. The Sears Road Handler 45 radial tire. It's on sale now for as low as $44.99 for the P155 ADR 13 size. And that includes Sears limited tread wear-out warranty for 45,000 miles. The Sears Road Handler 45, made by Michelin and sold only at Sears. There's more for your life. We installed confidence. At Sears. See store for warranty details. Sale ends August 2nd. You're moving in, and State Farm is there. Here we are, our new hometown. <sighs> now once we find our new house, we can look for a new bank, new school, new doctor. Finding our new insurance agent's going to be easy. Oh? I just saw a State Farm office around the corner. Just about anywhere you can move, a State Farm agent's there to give you the same good neighbor service you got from your State Farm agent back home. And like a good neighbor. Auto, home, life, and health. 
Anita, what do Don Wilson, Don Nottebart, Ken Force, Ken Johnson, Larry Durker, and Nolan Ryan have in common? That's easy. They all pitch no-hitters for Houston, Michael. Everybody knows that. I bet there are a lot of things, though, that people want to know about no-hitters that they don't know, but they'll find out today on Martini and Edmund Sports Talk. That's right, because Rich Coverly, who wrote the No-Hit Hall of Fame book, will be one of our guests, and he'll tell us everything we ever wanted to know about no-hitters. And, of course, well, how about this? On Martini and Edmund Sports Talk, tell me the last out of the Ken Force no-hitter. You gotta listen from four to seven to find out right here on kprc right here on kprc and we're talking about aviation today and the movement of all those airplanes up in the sky guess ron dickey with a tower out at intercontinental airport and with uh max uh tyndall max tyndall wasn't it, max max tyndall who is with houston center and he takes care of all the traffic outside of the city um let me ask, is it tougher doing this, Ron, than it is being out there in the tower talking to those pilots? I mean, which one is really more stressful? We... Uh, probably this, with <laughs> some of the questions we get asked. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see what some of them are. Hi, right, Tom, you're on KPRC Radio. Hello, Doug, how you doing? Very good, sir. Okay, I'd like to ask you this. Yes, um, whenever you look on the radar screen, do you see just a bleep? Do you see an airplane? When you have no radio contact uh, to the aircraft itself, but you can get uh, radio contact to it, how do you know whether it's a DC-10, just a two-engine plane? How do, you, um, how do you distinguish between the different type of airplanes? Good question, Tom. Well, when the aircraft takes off off the ground, uh, he goes from the tower to the departure controller, or he comes yeah, from the... We haven't got any... Okay, we, I, think, I think what Tom's talking about is just an airplane that's wandering in. Airplane just wandering in. And we, we don't, don't know... Any, and we don't have any radio uh, transmitting. And we don't, know, we don't have any idea of what he is until he calls us. And tells us the only thing we do is just issue traffic to the other aircraft that we are talking to in the same vicinity as that uh, radar target. Tom, a lot of airplanes today are equipped with a, with a device called a transponder. And uh, this is more or less the communication device with the uh, computer or the radar on the ground. And this will send them a little uh, a signal as to uh, uh, how fast the airplane is going, um, uh, the altitude, if it's an encoding type, as we call it. But other than that, you don't know what kind of airplane it is to you, on or where he's going, because he uh, he's not in radio contact with you. No, I mean, you know correct. his direction of flight at that moment, but uh, that's about it. Okay, let me ask you this. While we're telling them, shows up on your screen. Is there any way to, um, uh, is there any way to show uh, trouble or any uh, engine failures or anything other than the transmitting from the uh, pilot itself? Uh, with the transponder, if they have the encoder aboard, there are certain codes that the um, pilots, all pilots know and controllers know, and they squawk a certain code. And, uh, of course, it's real important that they come up on a frequency that's uh, common in the area as okay. soon as they start doing that to let us know exactly. Uh, all those codes do is tell us whether or not they have radar failure or whether they have uh, just some sort of general emergency or something to that nature. It doesn't give us any specifics. Okay, you're flying upside down and you have no idea where you're going and you can't, you can't land nationally while you're upside down, but you... When you're flying in the dark and you're flying upside down, you cannot tell whether you're flying straight up or upside down because the stars look just the same on the bottom as they do on the top. Mm -hmm. How do you distinguish from that point? Well, if you're flying upside down, I would surmise that uh, if you look up, you'd be able to see the ground. And uh, if you look down, vice versa, you'd be able to see the stars and the moon. So that would tell you in itself that you're upside down. Tom, I might be able to help you out a little bit with that part of it, since that's not really dealing with air traffic control so much. But I read an account some years ago about a guy who was coming in for a forced landing. He had lost power, electrical power. And uh, his lights had all gone out in his instruments. He was out in the country. And it was in a kind of a stormy situation. And he had a flare gun on board. Yeah. And he opened the window to fire the flare out so he could get a picture of the ground and what it looked like and then come back around and land there. And when he fired the flare out, instead of it going down, it went up from yeah. his from his vantage point. And uh, so he realized suddenly that he might be inverted. 
And very often the instruments on the uh, panel, uh, they don't look the same unless you're really looking at them carefully. So he immediately flipped the plane over and pancaked right into the ground at that point. He survived the crash, but at some point in there he had become inverted but didn't know about it. But the aircraft, air traffic controllers, they wouldn't know either unless you came by the tower that way, and then you're going to be in a lot of trouble anyhow. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, for calling. Hi, Paul. You're on KPRC Radio. Hi, Paul. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Now, since the uh, firing by President Nixon, I mean, <laughs> President Reagan of the thousands and thousands of air controllers, so much has been said about the stress that they, that they have in their job. Uh, also, has been an increasingly, increasingly amount of near misses while the planes are within the jurisdiction of the tower. Can you tell me, is this because of the lack of knowledge by the new controllers or the lack of personnel? I'm not even real sure there's uh, an increasing number of near misses, but Max, go ahead. Okay. I can't speak uh, nationally on that, but I can locally as far as the air traffic center is uh, concerned. But if I recall uh, correctly, I think the last year in calendar 85, we had like two near misses or near midair collision reports filed and I now, think now let's stop here for just a moment and talk about what a near miss is because it's a little wider distance than some people realize yeah, but what yeah. technically qualifies as a near miss uh i'm not even sure what uh, the pilot really has the call on that i think as to whether he feels like it endangered his safety mm -hmm. uh but uh, we have not had an increase in near midair collision reports here what in I'm this talking, area. What I'm talking about is when they, the tower gives the okay to the pilot to take off when another guy is coming down. Uh, again, uh, let me speak to that from the center standpoint, and then maybe Ron can add something to it. But uh, I know that we've had, uh, in the Houston center, we've had about a 75% reduction in... Uh, what we call an operational error, that's where we have less than uh, the separation that we're required to have. However, that in itself does not constitute a near mid-air collision. Mm -hmm. uh, our requirements in the center are to keep aircraft uh, basically five miles apart, and if we get them 4.8 miles apart, we've uh, not met our requirement. However, that's not anything near a near mid-air collision. Mm -hmm. Ron? Well, in the uh, approach control and towers uh, structure, we're required to have three miles within 30 miles of the uh, radar antenna and five miles outside of that. So uh, along the same lines as what Max was saying, if we have 2.8 or 2.9, we have less than standard separation, but the aircraft are still almost three miles apart. Mm -hmm. As far as the aircraft, uh, you see one on final coming into the airport and another one coming down. That is a... Uh, that is uh, what's normally done, and uh, with aircraft and the speeds that they're moving, it, to an uneducated eye, it always looks closer than what it actually is. The uh, runway itself at Intercontinental is 10,000 feet long, and if one aircraft is uh, halfway down and just lifting off, when the first one is just over the approach lights or just coming over, uh, just coming to the end of the approach end of the runway, you still have a mile between them plus visual separation. One of them's climbing and accelerating while the other one's slowing down and landing. So you don't have a uh, unsafe situation in that in that instance. Also, if the two pilots are able to see each other, you're allowed, you're, you can correct. get them a lot closer. That's visual separation. Okay, what, uh, what Paul's really coming up with here, and I'll go ahead and finish up the question, uh, Paul, if you don't mind, is do you think there has been any decrease in safety right. since all this uh, business came about? Do you, do you think we're better off today, worse off today, than we were before all of it, uh, the firing? I don't think that that would be a fair question for me to answer. The only thing that I can say is that uh, myself, I go out flying with friends from time to time, and I feel no no danger really at all. Yeah. So you feel like the system is, is certainly adequate, at least as adequate as it ever was? Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Paul, for calling. We'll be right back. Today, it's Dodge, Plymouth, and Chrysler who give you the best values in America. We're giving $500 or $1,000 cash back to retail buyers on most new 86 cars and trucks Chrysler builds in America. Depending on the model you buy from dealer stock, the offer doesn't include the exciting new 87 Omni America and Horizon America. Because with a sticker price of $54.99, excluding title taxes and destination charges, they're already the best small car values 
from America, Japan, or Korea. That's based on sticker price comparison of comparably equipped small cars. But whatever car you buy, the values are real. At Chrysler, we didn't raise prices on any of our 86 U.S. built cars, and we won't. And every car and truck we build gets our five-year or 50,000-mile protection plan. It excludes leases and restriction supply. See this limited warranty at your Dodge or Chrysler Plymouth dealer. That's where you get the best values in America. Now, for the very first time, Sales Jewelers Great Bulk Clearance offers you an opportunity to save 25 to 70 percent on buying jewelry. Sales must totally clear a bulk heaped with jewelry, diamonds, 14 karat gold, watches, and more. Hurry to Sales First Great Bulk Clearance. 25 to 70 percent savings from Sales. The world's leading jeweler. First come, first served. I want to feel good about everything in my life. I do aerobic exercise, I cut down on salt, and I use Murine. Murine is nothing but relief. Murine is the only leading eye drop that doesn't add vasoconstrictors that limit how often you can use them. Murine adds nothing but relief. Without those added ingredients, I can feel good about soothing my eyes with Murine anytime. is directed. Good afternoon again. If you're unemployed and looking for assistance in finding a job, the Houston Area Urban League is in employment development workshops right now. Call them today at 526-5127. We're talking to two of Houston's finest today as far as the air is concerned and trafficking the airplanes around the city of Houston. And it is very busy. As Ron pointed out a moment ago, we're number six in air traffic within the city right now. We have uh, Ron Dickey, uh, who is out at the Tower, Intercontinental Airport, and uh, we're also talking with Max Tyndall, who is with Houston Center, handles primarily the traffic right outside the terminal area itself. If you would like to talk to either of these two gentlemen, or both... There's going to be a dramatic increase in the near mid-air situation, both on the ground at airport terminal areas and in the air. Uh, in, in defense of what Max had said, though, I think he was uh, saying that he was not... Uh, uh, aware of any figures outside the Houston Center area that within this center uh, that uh, the near mid air collision rate is down I think and that's the Houston Center area well you've got to distinguish uh, Doug what uh, the difference between reporting a system error and what goes unreported and uh, matter of fact uh, the, one of the congressional committee's uh, reports that I was referring to last year indicated that, uh, well, they point blank caught the FAA uh, under-reporting near, near mid-airs uh, in the vicinity of somewhere around 400 to 500 percent. And the uh, example that the FAA gave, or the excuse the FAA gave, was that it slipped through the cracks at the regional level. Do you mean here that the FAA was not reporting it after the pilot had made the report? Well, there were a number of those such things, and just out and out not reporting by the controllers themselves because let's face it the uh the uh, faa wants to put the best face on the situation and and uh, i think i don't know these two two particular gentlemen uh -huh. but uh and i'm not saying that they were involved in this or anybody in particular was involved in it but the situation has been such that uh you don't report things that are questionable mm. and uh, so on and so forth we're not trying to you know, we're not trying to cover anything up, but we just don't want to put a bad picture, a face, on a, uh, on a serious situation. Hmm. Well, Max, did I quote you correctly a while ago when you said you were not aware of any numbers outside this area, but as far as our area is concerned, uh, you think the... Uh, that's correct, and I'm also uh, aware of the uh, charges that were made nationally uh, about the FAA uh, trying to conceal uh, near mid-air collision reports, and I, I really don't have any factual information concerning that. I can, but I can speak for this organization here that uh, there would never be any attempt at uh, trying to conceal that kind of information. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I wasn't particularly pointing any fingers at yeah. any individual, but it, it's already come come out. It, it's part of the congressional report. Uh, mm -hmm. It has been done. And whether it's continuing to go on at this time, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but there has been a uh, dramatic difference in what was reported and what was in fact happening. 
and that was the only point I was trying to make. Ron, do you feel like that this uh, that these charges made by this congressional committee? Do you think that this is because they're undermanned or or underexperienced or since that uh, since all that happened with the FAA? Well, Doug, it's to anybody who's vaguely familiar with the system, it's got to be a combination of many things. Mm -hmm. I mean, even Max and, and uh, Ron there uh, can can vouch for the fact that you don't take that number of controllers out of the system, experienced controllers, and replace them in what was initially supposed to be in a three-year time span, have the uh, system completely manned again with experienced or as experienced controllers. It just doesn't work, and they're finding that out. GAO has recommended that some uh, major steps be taken. Uh, the FAA made a commitment to the airline uh, uh, people that they would, in fact, get the, the restrictions off their back and allow them to compete in a, in a, a non well, as, as much as possible, non-restricted uh, flow control type situation. And uh, they had to put up or shut up, so they opened up the gates, and now these guys are having to take care of a, a lot more traffic uh, than they'd like to, and, and the GAO has... Uh, uh, indicated so uh, based on their recent study that uh, controllers feel that way and first line of supervisors feel that way that they are handling more traffic than they should be way more and it should stand to reason when when you have 15 16 thousand uh, veteran controllers and and today you have many thousands less than that handling as much or if not more traffic that you you can understand the situation it's not very hard uh, to understand how the, how the, how the system could be be uh, experiencing a strain right now. Thank you, Ron. Okay. I appreciate the comments. And when we get back, uh, Ron, you look like a uh, man with something on your mind. Uh, we'll ask you where we stand today as compared to back then. We'll be right back. The Ladies Professional Golf Association returns to its official home for the $300,000 Mazda Hall of Fame Championship at the Sweetwater Country Club in Sugar Land. You'll want to be a part of all the excitement the week of July 4th. Ticket Pro-Am and sponsorship information is available by calling 980-1200. You'll feel good in knowing that by your support, seven Houston and Fort Bend County charities will be the real winners. KPRC is the radio sponsor of the Mazda Hall of Fame Championship at the Sweetwater Country Club in Sugar Land, July 2nd through the 6th. Hey, honey, let's buy a new car. Those dealer loan rates look good. Mm, I'm not so sure. From what I've heard, special dealer rates don't always mean lower payments. By the way, have you checked financing at our credit union? No. What makes a credit union loan so special? Oh, lots. Low rates, payroll deduction repayment, no hidden charges, early payoff without penalty, and access to members' insurance group auto coverages. Okay, I'll call the credit union. I want to compare payments so I get the best auto loan. Now Al Carroll, Super Handyman, brought to you by Home Depot, the original do-it-yourself warehouse. One of the most common problems that I'm asked about are the white spots that show up on furniture. Now these are usually either white rings from a wet glass or blush marks from hot dishes. In most cases, these are going to easily be removed by using a very mild abrasive and oil. Now the abrasive can be super fine steel wool and the oil could be lemon oil furniture polish. Or you could use such weird things as cigar ashes or salt as the abrasive, or cooking oil or mayonnaise as the oil. The idea is to rub over the spot and usually you're going to make it go away. Now my all-time favorite for this is toothpaste. You just use toothpaste on a damp rag, wrap it around your finger, and then just rub and you're probably going to rub the spot away. After all, toothpaste is a mild abrasive. If that doesn't do it, add a little baking soda for a little bit more abrasive. Whatever you use, though, be sure it's not dry and that you don't rub hard enough to scratch it. I'm Al Carroll, the super handyman. We're back on. We're talking with uh, two of the air traffic controllers in the Houston area, one with uh, Houston Center, Max Tyndall, who, again, uh, that's the part of the air traffic control mechanism that handles the aircraft uh, outside of the city, both coming in and leaving, and those closer in uh, from the tower, and I'm sure that's not put exactly the way you two gentlemen would do it, but uh, Ron Dickey uh, is up at the tower, and he's talking to the aircraft while they're on the ground, while they're departing and leaving the Houston area. 
Uh, in Ron's uh, statement a while ago, I, I just have to ask you, Max, I guess uh, I'll ask you, uh, where do we stand today compared to prior to the firings that took place some years ago? Staffing or yeah, safety. staffing. It, the, the ratio between the staff, the experience, and the amount of traffic. You've already told us now the traffic is down a little bit in this area compared to a few years ago. Yeah, uh, okay, as far as the center's concerned, uh, the traffic in the Houston center has declined significantly over the last three or four years. Uh, we attribute most of that to decline in the economy here in the area. Mm -hmm. The uh, As far as center staffing and experience level goes, uh, we are anticipating, well, first of all, uh, let me say this, that it was recognized that the facility could be operated safely with fewer controllers than what were on board before the strike. Uh, our current uh, staffing authorization is somewhere in the neighborhood of 283 full performance level controllers. Uh, we anticipate having approximately 75% of that number at the end of this calendar year. Now, realistically, uh, even before the strike, when there was something in the neighborhood of 360 or 370 controllers authorized at the center, uh, only about 75% of those controllers were full, were full performance level, and the remainder were uh, trainees. So it's, you've got essentially the same ratio that we have today. Experience level uh, is, is lower than it was certainly before the strike but also because of the decline in traffic and uh, effective traffic management means uh, we're much better prepared to handle the traffic than we were before. Mm -hmm. Very good. Hello, you're on KPRC Radio. Hello. Okay, we lost that one. Let's go to Gary. How are you today, Gary? We're on KPRC Radio. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. One of those little airplane drivers calling in. <laughs> you know, referred to sometimes. Yeah, and, and sometimes we're afraid that they don't like us too much, Gary, and uh, we're being real nice today. Well, I, and I know that. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't uh, really uh, have that problem with the controllers. First of all, happy anniversary to the controllers. Thank you. Thank you. And um, second of all, the, the previous caller, uh, I don't want to bore the audience with IFR and VFR, but uh, very often, since I'm just one of those VFR little airplane drivers, I do request what we call flight following. And to date, I have never yet been turned down by a controller for flight following. So I think that does uh, let some people know that uh, they are there and they are available because the IFR traffic does, in fact, get uh, first preference. Let me point out, uh, if I may, Gary, uh, what flight following is. Uh, this is a situation where a pilot is not on an instrument flight plan. That is, he's normally not an, uh, flying a big jet or something, just a little, as you say, one of us little airplane drivers. And we get an extraordinary amount of help uh, that is not required of them to give us, but they give us nevertheless. That's correct. Mm -hmm. It is very helpful. Uh, a couple points just that I wanted to go along with. Uh, the FAA has been sponsoring the uh, pilot proficiency program for some time, and I have had an opportunity to attend a couple of those. Uh, along with that, this year with the uh, anniversary of air traffic control, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association is sponsoring the uh, uh, take a, take a uh, controller to lunch or the uh, fly a controller program. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I guess a comment from the two gentlemen there, uh, what their feeling is as far as improving the communication and understanding and then maybe to tie that in with uh, is there any way we can ever move to the next step when a, a person like myself uh, is on a commercial flight where we could have an opportunity to actually uh, say ride in the jump seat and, and just develop more understanding and communication with the uh, commercial jet pilot good point that would be something that would be between that person and the uh, airlines themselves. Uh, they're very restrictive, as I understand, about who goes into the cockpit, and that's understandable. Uh, as far as I know, as I said, that's just between the uh, individual concerned and the airline. Mm -hmm. Any, uh, any uh, results as far as how many controllers have participated in that fly controller program? that's currently going on? I really don't have any figures or statistics on it. I have known of a few who have participated in it, and uh, as far as I know, it's been uh, pretty well recept uh, received uh, from our end. I know from my own self, my own per uh, personal point of view, is I like to get out and kind of see what the other side does and what they're involved in. That's good, and Gary, it might be easier for us to ask him uh, how many times he's been asked to lunch. 
rather than how many cockpits he's been in. We'll be back in just a moment. We're talking about air traffic control. A stylish Cougar, stock number 1972, is loaded and sale priced till 9 p.m. tomorrow for only 11875 Only at Jack Criswell Lincoln Mercury, Gulf Freeway at Woodridge. Now let's check on the traffic around the Houston area with John Greer. Doug, we are over the Southwest Freeway right now at the scene of an overturned 18-wheeler. It's outbound just past Bissonette. The left two lanes are blocked. They are allowing two lanes of traffic to get by on the right shoulder and on the right lane. So uh, traffic is moving through this area, but it is backed up all the way back to around the loop as we look back towards downtown. Other problems around town, North Freeway outbound at the loop, a minor accident reported there. East Tex Freeway is running slow from Laura Copy to Little York. Uh, West Belt at Hammerley, an accident's been reported on the west side, and I'm John Greer and the Sky Spies standing by. President and First Lady Health and Racquetball Clubs have everything you need to get in shape. Join at any of our 13 locations now and get two years for the price of one. Now at President and First Lady. I don't know how to break this to you, but wine coolers are very high in calories. All but one, that is. New Dewey Stevens Premium Light. Dewey's made with premium white wine, real fruit juices, and natural fruit flavors for a clean, fresh taste and a third less calories than ordinary coolers. New Dewey Stevens Premium Light. Hey, hey, Dewey. Clean, fresh, and one-third less. Dewey. Dewey. Anheuser-Busch St. Louis. Take a lesson now. I went down to school, and who did I see? Tastes so peanutty because it's made from the best peanuts in the world. Eat some peanut butter every time you can. Only if it's peanut butter. Open up a jar now. We're having the pleasure this afternoon of visiting with uh, two air traffic controllers here for the Houston area. One is named Ron Dickey, who works in the, uh, the uh, control tower out at Intercontinental Airport. Uh, the other is Max Tyndall, who handles uh, what we call Houston Center. I, uh, I want to ask you, how are we going to go about celebrating this 50th anniversary that's coming up on the 6th of July? Well, on, uh, we're celebrating it here in Houston on July the 19th and 20th. Oh, okay. That's Saturday and Sunday from noon to 6, both days. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're celebrating it with an open house at both facilities. Mm -hmm. At uh, Houston Tower, we are going to have the top parking level of Terminal A blocked off, and we're going to have displays up there from various airlines. The uh, airport fire department's going to have a display up there. The airport police is going to have a display. And this is open all to the public and absolutely free. That's correct. And this would not be limited necessarily to pilots, would it? Wouldn't anybody no, who no, flies and public. wants to know what goes on? They can see the radars, the computers, the whole works right. in, in both correct. facilities. And the, the center and the tower are running their open houses concurrently and will have transportation between the facilities. That's the 19th and 20th. Yeah, Keep correct. me posted. I was going and I'll announce it a few more times. Thank you all so much for being with us today. NBC News. Good afternoon. I'm Alan Walden. What killed Len Bias also killed Don Rogers, the Cleveland Browns defensive back who died suddenly last Friday on the eve of his wedding.